Welcome to CB8 Speaks. My name is Alita Camp and I'm your host for today. I'm thrilled to welcome Valerie Mason, the brand new chair of Community Board 8. Welcome, Valerie. I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here, Alita. Thank you so much for having me. I think it's our great pleasure to learn more about you as you take the helm of Community Board 8, which is no easy feat. You've already been, as you said, I think at the most recent board meeting in baptism by fire. Exactly. So that brings me to my first question, which is you are a brand new chair. You've only been doing this for a few weeks, but you were hit with a lot in the beginning of your term. How are you enjoying this? It's been great so far. I mean, I just think, first of all, Community Board 8 is a very talented bunch of New Yorkers. So they will keep you on your toes and make sure you're keeping up to date with everything. And everyone is very knowledgeable and it's really inspiring to see how interested and engaged everyone in our community is. So it's really a pleasure working with everyone. And um, obviously we're very opinionated, each one of us. And um, it's very interesting to get to know how people get to their opinions and, you know, in some cases, turn your head on things. So it's been really great so far, I have to say. Well, in the last few weeks, you have gotten and seem to be really engaged with both the community and the board members. And that's very exciting for us. And I'm Thank speaking as a, as a board member. What priorities do you see for the community? Well, I think we're at a very interesting time. I mean, the mayor has proposed the city of yes. It's a really bold proposal and it's quite overwhelming. We just finished reviewing and I'll put that in quotes, reviewing 18 different proposals that he's proposed for the economic opportunity piece. And we're about to head into the housing piece, which is sort of a little bit of an unknown. Um, everyone is starting to get up to speed on it. But the city of yes for economic opportunity continues. And I think there are going to be a lot of discussions going forward. And there may be some things that we find out about it that we didn't even know while we were reviewing it um, these last couple of weeks and months. So it's a very interesting time. I mean, the zoning resolution hasn't really been touched since 1960, and this is a proposed enormous overhaul. So it will be very interesting to see what happens. Many community boards across the city have already come out against the entire proposal. Our community board, as you all know, was uh, up and down on certain pieces of it. And also when I met for the first time as part of the borough board, um, there was quite a diversity of opinion amongst the 12 boards that were represented at that meeting as well. So that's going to be a very interesting discussion going forward. The other, I was just going to say, the other priority we really have is affordable housing on the Upper East Side. Um, contrary to popular belief by other communities, we are very interested in having affordable housing in our community. It's quite tough. Um, not because we don't want it, but because it's very hard to get developers to help us meet that goal. And we lose a lot of affordable housing in the process of getting new housing. So it's a very hard balancing act to try to get affordable housing on the Upper East Side. But our community board is committed to that. And I hope that we can work forward and make some differences in that area. There is a perception, it seems, that the Upper East Side is all well-heeled, well silk stocking, wealthy residents, how do we combat that? And so people understand the economic diversity, the racial diversity, the age diversity that we have on the Upper East Side and our interest in having affordable housing. Well, I think people need to meet us where we are. And if you come to the Upper East Side, I think you will see a, a huge diversity of age and economic status. But you can't just be on one part of the Upper East Side. I mean, you can't just walk up and down Park Avenue and think that that's really the totality of the Upper East Side. We go all the way down to York Avenue, East End Avenue, and there's quite a diversity of business and people, young people. We have a lot of students who are attending Weill Cornell Medical School. We've got students from Hunter College. We have a wide variety of people living in our neighborhood. And I think that's what we're all afraid of losing with Upper East Side high-rise developments. And I think that's a real concern. And it's very, I don't think we have an answer for it yet, but we're all striving to find the right balance. How do you think the priorities of community district aid differ from those of the city's administration? 
That's a really tough question. I mean, I think we're all interested in the same things. I mean, I think we all love the city. We want to be able to live here. I think for our community, the quality of life is probably the most important issue on the Upper East Side. We don't have a tremendous amount of crime. I mean, crime has gone up if you look at the facts. But in terms of overall stability, our crime rate is very low uh, against other neighborhoods in the city. And we're very lucky about that. But I think it's really a quality of life issue on the Upper East Side. And people may poo-poo that as being important. But when you're living in the middle of Manhattan, quality of life is very important. We know New York City has suffered a lot of changes or gone through a lot of changes as a result of COVID. We've seen the closure of many, many small businesses. People aren't going into work more than three days, it seems, at the most. Have you noticed other changes in the neighborhood yeah. or the city? I think the most noticeable change is the number of homeless people who are living on our sidewalks. It's hard to even understand how that all came about so quickly, but it seems, I hate to say this, it seems like it happened overnight. On the Upper East Side, we, had, we have a tremendous number of homeless people. Luckily, you don't see a lot of families living on the sidewalk, but we do have a tremendous number of I would say people who have varying degrees of mental illness, mental illness and drug addiction. And sometimes it's a combination of both. And for whatever reason, maybe because we have the Second Avenue subway, so we're seeing a lot more of them as well because of that. But also too, and I, you know, I say this in the best possible way, one of the reasons that we're seeing a lot of homeless people on the Upper East Side is the same reason that a lot of people who can afford to live on the Upper East Side are here. It's low crime. People are extremely generous. We have, unfortunately, a homeless person um, living on our corner. And at least once a week, I see somebody drop off new bedding in a plastic bag for her. Wow. And, you know, people are giving her food. And I, you know, I don't, if you listen to organizations that deal with the homeless population, that's not necessarily the best thing because they're trying to engage them to come inside. And the fact that they're being taken as good as care as you can take of someone who has no home, which is really unfortunate, it's sort of working against that. But it is rather shocking how overnight this, uh, this problem has become more noticeable to everybody. I mean, and um, unfortunately, there doesn't seem like there's a lot that is, can be done about it. Certainly no quick fixes. Exactly, exactly. No, it's not our district, but Bur I think it was Borough President Levine who talked at our board meeting this week mm -hmm. about keeping the state hospital on Randall's Island yeah. open. Yeah, I grew up right over across the bridge in Astoria. We used to walk over the bridge onto the island and see that hospital rather bustling. And I actually thought it was closed. Um, and he had said that they were really going to close the whole thing but he has been encouraging them. I think he said the other evening, another 400 beds opening up. And I think that's probably a good thing. So um, I know he issued a, a report at the end of the year about the state of you know, mental illness in, in New York and what can be done about it. So I think everyone is trying to do something positive and that's all, we can just try to do that together. I know the city was calling for volunteers to try and map where homeless people are in the street to help them when it's particularly cold out. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, we have a returning population. I mean, I've seen the same homeless man living in our neighborhood for 20 years. And I don't know where he goes at night or what he does, but he's back every day, so. How did you become involved with the community board? By accident, actually. It was an outgrowth well, it was an outgrowth of the Second Avenue subway. And the Second Avenue subway project was coming into being. And we understood the people who lived on my block that they were going to site one of the entrances to the Second Avenue subway instead of being on Second Avenue in the middle of 72nd Street in front of a residential building and a, a, and a very wide street. We thought that that was a real safety concern because we thought people would be running across in the middle of the street. And quite frankly, we didn't understand why the entrance to the Second Avenue subway wouldn't be on Second Avenue. And so we started organizing. And I, I mean, I've grown up in New York. I don't want to say my whole life because it's not over yet. And I honestly never knew that there was such a thing as the community board. And so that was my first introduction to the of any community board, let alone community board eight. 
And as I started going to those meetings that were specifically about the Second Avenue subway, I learned that there were a lot more things going on and my interest was piqued. And so ever since then, I've been going to community board meetings in my spare time. Clearly. <laughs> now you're running it and uh, you'll yeah. see as chair the way I learned that you learn about every issue exactly. affecting the district, even exactly. things you had no idea that about. That is so true. That is so true. Did you begin the 72nd Street Association? Yeah, I did. And I want to give a shout out to Ben Kalos because he was the one who encouraged me to do it. We had a loose knit group when we started our civic activism, if you will, around the 2nd Avenue subway, sort of went by the wayside. And then all of a sudden other issues started to happen. Um, an issue that we're actually still advocating for on 72nd Street, which is getting a select bus stop back on the corner of 72nd Street and 2nd Avenue and 1st Avenue. That, that would take more than an hour to actually talk about. But, and so we started to put this neighborhood association together and, and, we, and we, we have one now. It's basically representing, we have at least 20 buildings that belong to it. We meet on a monthly basis and then we have four meetings a year, which were our public meetings. And we, and we talk about uh, different topics. Actually, we have one coming up on Tuesday where the focus is going to be homelessness and e-vehicle safety. Ah. So two very important issues. Certainly e-vehicle safety, very contentious. Yes, and, exactly. And a lot of opinionated people exactly. on that one. But you're so effective at getting groups of people organized and tackling difficult issues. You're very involved in uh, congestion pricing issues, and, and that's a big one. Yeah, there isn't a one opinion on congestion pricing. I mean, I guess the devil will be in the rollout as is in most things. You know, I am personally opposed to it. Um, our community board uh, voted in favor of it as a concept before it even was really rolled out, but they, our community board thought it was something that would, would be a positive. I think that the closer we get to the unveiling of it, so to speak, the more people ha are finding out what is exactly happening. And I think there's at least two sides to every story, and I think probably more with congestion pricing. And I think we're going to see more of that as we get closer to the, to the opening date, if you will. Yeah, I think you could absolutely <laughs> be right about that. You mentioned that you grew up in Queens. When did you leave for the borough of Manhattan? Ah, well, I have to say, I don't really think I've ever left the borough of Queens. Um, my mother and father lived there. Uh, for most of their lives. My remaining parent, my mom, passed away last year at the age of 92, and she was living in Astoria. So my sisters and I were constantly back there and still go there now. Living in Astoria was probably the best place in Queens to live because um, you could get into Manhattan very easily by subway, even by taxi cab then. It wasn't probably a $50 ride. It was more like an $8 ride. So um, I have to say that we were in Manhattan as much as we were in Queens, in fact, more in Manhattan. My dad and my mom, too, would always take us to the museums, and we had a very big life at, in Queens as well as Manhattan. I will say that we never really went to Brooklyn or <laughs> as a rule, but most people who live in Queens actually don't go to Brooklyn. Part of that is related to public transportation, and it's not that easy to get to, quite mm -hmm. honestly. I never learned how to drive you know, all the years I grew up, I had to go to law school to learn how to drive. But that's, a, again, a whole nother story. I know. I think was a lot of New Yorkers don't have driver's licenses. My mother lived to 98 and she never learned there you go. to drive. There you go. Um, has your Queens neighborhood as a story changed? It's changed a lot. When I grew up there, it was very much an immigrant neighborhood. When my parents first came, my, my mom is of Italian descent and my father was of German descent. And they, that was a, very much the, the neighborhood then. And then um, it became largely a Greek neighborhood when I was there. I mean, um, I'm told that it had the largest Greek population outside of the city of Athens that was living in Astoria. So the, the upshot of that was we had fantastic restaurants and a lot of different people. It's a lot of always families, I have to say. Now, this seems to be a little bit more gentrification than when I was there. It was really a working class neighborhood, I have to say, but always had great schools. I went to public school. I love my school, all my schools, actually. But it, it's pretty much, it's the same, a little bit different, a little bit more, I think, politically progressive than when I grew up there. But it's the same, and, and the location makes it a great place 
to be. So um, I go back very often and I take all my Manhattan friends and they get hooked very easily. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that you go back. Yeah. I grew up in the Bronx, so oh, I okay. know that it never, it never really quite leaves you. No. What was your favorite thing about growing up here? I felt like I wasn't one of those people who ever wanted to move to the suburbs. I think that, you know, where I grew up, people had backyards. I mean, we didn't particularly, we did not personally have a backyard. I grew up on the second floor, second floor apartment. But Astoria has to this day one of the most amazing parks. Um, it has a huge swimming pool, which we went to all the time. And I actually learned how to play tennis. Uh, it had uh, like 20 tennis courts. There was a tennis club at our at our New York City park, and I learned to play there. And um, so I think that was my favorite my favorite thing about Astoria, which just that you know there were so many things to do there, and it was such a great neighborhood. Is that how you developed your interest in tennis? Because you're quite an avid fan. Um, my father was a tennis player. He actually learned how to play tennis from Vitas Gerolitis' father. Wow. And at the time that I grew up, some of the best tennis players in the world came from Queens. John McEnroe, one of them, and Vitas Gerolitis, the younger, was the other one. He actually was, when I was at Barnard, he was like a senior at Columbia. And so there was a lot of tennis, and actually there was an organization called the National Junior Tennis League, which has now morphed into the New York Junior Tennis League, which promotes tennis and learning all across the city. It's one of the great programs combining you know, athletics with learning. And it was a great experience. And my sister in particular, one year, she went to the national finals and they went to Michigan wow. and she met Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and played tennis with him. So wow. after that, I had to learn because, you know, you never really want to let your sister do anything better than you. In so. New York is full of things like that, programs and activities and adventures that are, are you wouldn't know about if you weren't involved. You mentioned earlier that you were up at 3.30 in the morning watching the Australian Open yes, last night. Yes, yeah. So I'll blame the bags under my eyes for that. But I don't play any tennis anymore. That is, I guess, one of the things I've given up by doing all this other civic activity stuff. But um, I was a ball girl out at Forest Hills. I, was a, um, I worked at the U.S. Open for many years. My youngest sister, Margaret, for many years, helped run the ball kids and was still running across the nets up until about three or four years ago. So those kids work so hard yes. running after the balls. Did you like it? I loved it. They are the unsung heroes of the U.S. Open. It's a great experience. You just need a lot of energy. Yes, you need a lot of energy. I did it once in Madison Square Garden and the ball got caught, caught in the net and I could not get it out. And it was so humiliating. And um, I finally did get it out and the entire Madison Square Garden started clapping. So that was like my one claim to fame. <laughs> So I want to mention that you're going to be presented with the 17th Annual Executive of the Year Award this week. The Executive of the Year Award recognizes excellence in entrepreneurial spirit and for women who have achieved a success in business and helped other women achieve their goals. So obviously you have great skill in the area of mentoring as well as as organizing and uh, and being quite confident in the business well, world. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, the New York Institute of Credit, I you know, have to thank them for this. You know, when I started practicing law, there weren't a lot of women who were doing it. And so it's been lonely for many years. I think I heard this week for the first time ever, there are going to be more women, female associates for in first year classes than ever before which is a milestone and that's great. And I hope that one day that that number will be something that can be said about women who are partners in law firms because we seem to lose a lot of them along the way. I've been alone in the room for a long time and I've been practicing law a long time and I'm very happy to say that I'm not alone anymore. And it's one of the things that inspires me to keep going. It's been a pleasure mentoring some of the, the younger women as they come along and encouraging them to stay with it even when they have children. It's a different experience, but I always say, don't ever let anyone tell you you're not a full-time mother when you're out working in, in, in the legal profession or any other job for that matter. You're always a full-time mother. That's great advice. 
you're also involved in supporting women through the work you do with women who have been in prison. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about That's that? That's really important to me. I started getting involved in that actually when my son was born 28 years ago, a little before that. I started volunteering once a week, teaching a class at Bayview Correctional Facility, which a lot of people don't realize was across the street from Chelsea Piers. And I taught a class about money addiction, and I met a lot of women who were in prison. And I realized then that many of these women were very much like a lot of the working middle class women that, or young girls that I knew growing up. They suffered from really low self-esteem. The difference really is that for a lot of the women that I met in prison, they, they wound up you know, involved in drugs and in jail with falling in with the wrong people. For a lot of the middle class, working class women that I knew, they developed eating disorders and became wow. very sick. So I felt a real, I don't know, empathy. And I could see that these women in, in a different circumstance would, would turn out a different way. And so I became very committed to that. And I, I'm still on that board, I'm on the board of Women's Prison Association at home. And we've been running alternative to incarceration programs. Um, we, we run a, a shelter over on uh, Avenue A that unites women who've been in the, in the system with their children. And it really is an incredible thing to see how children, once they're, first of all, their mother is always their mother, no matter what, whether she's in prison or out of prison. And there's a bond there that cannot be broken. And when the women are united with their children, it really gives them the motivation to turn their lives around. And I think people have a really wrong impression of a lot of women who've been in the, in the system and men too, but I can only speak to the women because that's who I've, I've been working with a lot. And, you know, we try to have those women meet people who haven't been in the system. And it's, I think, always more beneficial for the people who haven't been in the system to see that these are really real people who've had different circumstances and are really, truly just like them who need, a, who need a, another chance. And sometimes for people who have you know had drug addiction or whatever it takes a couple of times of going to a rehab to turn your life around the same is somewhat true too for people who have been in prison i mean i know some women who actually you know used to go to prison in the winter you know because otherwise they would be homeless i mean it sounds crazy but these things happen and it's really unfortunate and we should be a little bit more kind i mean it used to be like people would say, oh my gosh, you mean we're going to have college classes in prison? Well, you know, how are these people going to turn their lives around if they're not able to really avail themselves of opportunities that are there for other people? So anyway. Alternatives to incarceration is somewhat of a controversial topic. How uh, have you been advocating or working on that and how is it, yeah. how is it coming along? It's a, a combination program. I mean, we've been doing it for many years. I mean, obviously it's, it's not available for every single crime. So, you know, you don't want people to get the wrong idea. Like you've, you, you, know, you know, you've just been convicted of murder and we say alternative to incarceration. No, it's not like that at all. It's really related to, uh, you know, drug related crimes or um, maybe, um, you know, financial crimes. I mean, the, the candidates for alternative to incarceration are identified by the district attorneys and other people in the uh, criminal justice system, people who would be decent candidates who maybe if they had the right job or in the right situation, they would have the ability to turn around. And it's, you know, honestly, a much cheaper uh, alternative to having somebody locked up in these really uh, very dehumanizing and inhumane circumstances. But that doesn't mean that anybody who's involved in this is not against prison and is not saying that people shouldn't go to jail if they commit crimes. That's, that's not what that, this movement is about at all. So, Let's just talk about you for a couple okay. of minutes with okay. the time that we have. What do you like to do in your spare time? Well, spare time, there's not really very much. So I like to spend it with my husband and my family. He ha my husband has a very uh, engaging career and does a also a lot of things outside of his regular law practice. And so we spend uh, basically our spare time just to get together, uh, hanging out, um, doing 
we love um, we love art and you know and we love walking around. I mean, one of the things we love to do is just walk around New York City. And so uh, it, it, it's not surprising to find us walking somewhere in Manhattan on the weekends or driving somewhere and then parking the car and just walking around. So uh, there's always something really fascinating to see in New York. That's one of the great things about it. And one of the things that we hope endures is the diversity of neighborhoods and the individual characteristics of neighborhoods. Yeah, having grown up in Astoria and now living on the Upper East Side, um, I'm not one of those people who stays in her neighborhood. I mean, every pretty much every weekend you can find me downtown at some point during the weekend. Um, and also at different neighborhoods and, and just seeing what New York has to offer. I mean, I have to say that I have to give credit to my friend, Mary Lou, who during COVID every weekend, we, she, you know, was very much out there exploring every single neighborhood from Sheepshead Bay to Staten Island to Jamaica Bay and Queens. And so we sort of used the downturn and, the, you know, there weren't a lot of people to get to see a lot of different things. I have to put in a plug for Central Park. You can go to Central Park every weekend of the year and see something different in a different place. And I think that's one of the beauties of Central Park, not having a, a you are here at every moment. It's the beauty of it just to, you know, ramble through it and find a new place. And especially and, uh, if you like to watch people. They're always exactly. doing, they have tango in the park. Exactly. And over the sculptures, Alice exactly. in Wonderland. What books have influenced you in your life? Yeah. I don't do a lot of really heavy reading anymore. I'm usually at the tail end of the night. I'm sort of like going into that mindless sleep. But I was very influenced um, by a great college professor that I had, Dennis Dalton at Barnard College here in the city. I took a class with him about political leadership. And I have to say, when I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, I found it to be one of the most um, inspiring and illuminating books I've read. I mean, it's a really incredible story about, about leaders, about there's different phases of leadership, exclusive, inclusive, you know, the journey. Professor Dalton, and I say that with a lot of respect, was a great follower of Gandhi. And it was very interesting. I mean, I think that sort of got me also interested in civil disobedience and activism. And those books left a great impression on me. And the, the other one I was saying to you earlier was The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan. You know, equality in the workplace, that was really her expertise and where she was focused on in terms of feminism. And her second book, talking about the only way to true equality is for both sexes to come together and figure out what works because it's really not without the support of your spouse or whomever that, you know, childcare duties can be worked out and, and everyone can find happiness in their careers or whatever they're doing. She received a lot of criticism for that, but I think, you know, where we are in the society today, I think those questions still remain and are unresolved. And hopefully that's when I'm, when I'm talking about women making it to partners in law firms a lot of the unresolved issues that that book talked about still remain the reason why. You must have had a lot of support from your husband yeah. to have a child, to make partner, to do all the civic yeah. work that you do. And so women would seem to, to need that. And from the law firm as well, yeah. for the firm. Yeah. For both people to succeed, I, I truly think that it does mean that the other person you know, something has to give, you know, there's not a perfect world. There's no such thing as a superwoman or whatever. Every, nothing comes without sacrifice or, you know, uh, something that didn't get done. So anybody who thinks that that's going to happen, that I can tell you right now that there's always going to be something that doesn't get done. So, um, you know, you have to be, you have to find happiness in the balance that you create yourself. I have a very supportive husband and, uh, and a, not only supportive, but very enthusiastic. And because I, I don't know if you can get this from me. I'm kind of a, a negative person. So I've ne actually <laughs> never, ever noticed that. Well, your parents must have been very proud of you. Yeah, they are really my role models. I mean, it's a very interesting couple, my parents. My mother didn't graduate from high school. And my dad was an artistic kind of guy. He was in an advertising, but in the creative end. But my mother, always very active in the PTA, and she was a fighter. And she, for better or worse, told, you know, taught me how to fight, both literally and figuratively. And she was also very active politically. 
And if she got behind a cause, that was it. You know, she was in full boat. And so it took me a while to sort of dial back from that a little bit. And I'm still learning that, but because she was always very passionate. But she always had a very compassionate side for strangers. And I think my sisters and I inherited that as well. I mean, it wouldn't be unusual to find somebody who didn't have a home who was sitting in our apartment. Or, you know, we'd be eating in a fast food restaurant and my mother would see somebody and she'd get up from the table and she'd come back and we'd say, well, what happened? She said, well, I think that man was looking for a job and I know that, you know, she worked for New York Telephone. I know we're hiring. So I went over and, and gave him a, a contact person. So we learned that from them. And my dad is, was really a people person too. And, and also too, he was a real athlete. He had three daughters. And he taught us that we could be great athletes too. And for me, I think that made me feel confident in going into professions and doing things where they were all men. And I always felt good about myself. And I knew about the things that men talked about. And I felt very comfortable talking about that as well. Well, in the nature versus nurture debate, I think you've covered both <laughs> grounds. And you could point to yourself as a success from having learned from your parents. Thank the, you the open-heartedness, the generosity, the community engagement, the athleticism, the interest in people that, that you've brought to the community board ever since I've known you. Yeah, I, that's the great thing about the community board too, is everyone has a passion for something and we're all combining that together in this great, I'm gonna say melting pot of what is the Upper East Side. And to know you're not alone, that you know, that, you know, people have this impression of New Yorkers as being these very hard, uh, you know, anonymous people, but um, I really find New York to be a real small town. And, you know, it's, and, and once you get in it, you know, you see people everywhere and they're doing all sorts of really inspiring things. Well, it's the end of our time. So I'd like to thank you so much for being here and sharing yourself with us. It is fascinating opportunity to learn about you and, and your goals and priorities. Well, thank, so you. thank you. And I, I just want to invite everybody from Community Board District 8 to come out and see us because we want to see everybody. So that would be great. Thank you so much, Alita. Oh, my, my great pleasure. And thank you to Manhattan Neighborhood Network for hosting us. We'll see you again. Thank you. <laughs> well, have to, you'll have to come out to Queens with me and I'll show you all about us. Uh,